In 2013, Harold Pollack, PhD, a social scientist at the University of Chicago, posted a photo online of an index card. And on that index card was what he claimed to be the only financial advice that you ever needed to know. And that photo went viral. On that index card are nine rules of financial advice. And I'm going to tell you what each one of those are, what they mean, and what you need to know about them. So in general, I agree with where Dr. Pollock is coming from on this. He is coming from the standpoint that there's a lot of overcomplicated financial advice out there, and too much of it, right? And so much of it even conflicts. And he wanted to try to cut through the BS and create a simple enough format that it could fit on an index card and that you didn't have to do any more work than that, just follow those rules. And I think that's great. Um, I think that he's heading in the right direction here. But the weakness of those types of stone tablet Ten Commandments style uh, rules is that they don't take into account individual differences. There's a lot of it depends in things like personal finance and that's one of the things that causes all of this seemingly conflicting advice. So I'm going to get into where these rules are weak on the it depends part as well. But again, uh, in general, I like the format of having nine or ten simple rules. I think that it can lead to some powerful places for people. Um, it's just that with individual circumstances, there's always a little more work that needs to be done. So let's get into it. The first rule is max your 401k or equivalent employee contribution. So what that is, a 401k is a tax advantaged account. And you, whether you have an employer or you're self-employed, you contribute pre-tax dollars to that account. And what's great about that is that it decreases your taxable income, which means you pay less taxes, and also that money that you have set aside then grows with compound interest pre-tax, which means it's a bigger lump to keep growing and growing and growing. So there's a lot of great stuff going on, and a lot of employees even have uh, employee matches. They'll match up to a certain percentage of your contributions, and that's just free money. So this is a no-brainer as long as you're not living hand to mouth and you actually have the income that you can set aside there. And if you don't, then figure out a way that you can get there. So even if the funds are not that good with high management fees, this is still one to follow. And speaking of management fees, his next piece of advice is pay attention to the fees, avoid actively managed funds. Now the fees are a percentage of the money that you pay in order to have your money invested. And actively managed funds tend to have higher fees than some other funds such as passively managed funds, right? So he's using this heuristic of avoid the actively managed funds because otherwise you're paying too much fees. And that's not always true. But his first piece of advice, I think, is the most important, which is pay attention to those fees. Um, so, for example, some actively managed funds might have 2% to 3% management fees, whereas a lot of total stock market passive index funds are as low as 0 0.05 or even 0%. So it's a no-brainer if you know, one fund is performing the same as the other and you're paying less fees, you want that fund, right? You want the one that has less fees. Now, why would someone choose to invest in an actively managed fund? Well, 
if they're getting better results. <laughs> so despite paying 2% fees in an actively managed fund, if that fund is getting better results than something else that you might invest in, you would still want to invest in that. But be a conscious consumer, be aware of those fees, and that's going to put you on all, uh, the right path there. The next piece of advice is to uh, maximize tax-advantaged vehicles, savings vehicles like Roth, SEP, and 529 accounts. So that's really C number one about the 401k. If you have enough income, you want to be setting that money aside because saving on your taxes is awesome. And being able to have money grow before it's even taxed is awesome as well. It really makes a difference down the road. But here's an it depends, right? Maybe you have some credit card debt and you need to attack that first because if you're paying 10% on credit card fees, you're not going to make that up in tax savings you know, or your investments. So, And also you just need to get rid of debt. Um, you do not want to have a debt mindset. That's something you need to get rid of. So, you know, you need to do that first. Also, maybe you have a very compelling reason to save up some money that needs to be liquid right now. For example, if you are trying to start a business and you'd rather save up a bunch of money so that you don't have to take a business loan and you can have that runway to quit your job and start up that business. Well, if you want to go all in on that, you may not want to defer some money to the future. So there could be some reasons to not go all in on putting all your money um, in vehicles that are just make it not available until you're after 60. A next piece of advice is to buy inexpensive well-diversified mutual funds such as Vanguard 20XX funds. So what those are. So a target uh, mutual fund, so for example, like Vanguard 2040 fund. Let's say I was going to retire in 2040. Well, I would get that fund and that would do a lot of the work for me of the balancing, right? It would be more aggressive in the beginning because I'm just putting that money aside. So it'd be very stock heavy. But towards the end, when I get closer to that retirement date of 2040, it would start to shift to more stable, less volatile funds. So the good part about that is it's a, it's a set it and forget it philosophy. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of work. But there are a couple of downsides on that. Um, first of all, you might be able to get better results in something simpler like a passive stock index fund. If you're in the beginning, and you know you're 25 and you can be as aggressive as you want to be about your future savings that you're not going to touch for another you know 40 years right why not be 100 percent aggressive instead of 90 percent aggressive and also going back to his previous piece of advice watch those fees some of the target fund fees have some of the target funds have higher fees than some of those uh you know, simpler passive stock index funds. His next piece of advice is never buy or sell an individual security. The person on the other side of the table knows more than you do about this stuff. <laughs> and as advice to an average person seeking an average comfortable retirement, I cannot fault that advice. You never need to buy an individual stock to get wealthy and have a great retirement, right? So in general, I definitely agree with that. And I want to drill into this though a little bit because, you know, who is that other person, you know, on the other side of the table, right? That he's talking about. He's talking about Wall Street. He's talking about the hedge fund managers, those people who have so much more resources than you do when it comes to investing that you can never win as much as they do. But you need to be careful here, and this is what turns people off on investing, is that just because the game is rigged, and it is rigged, 
not in your favor, you still need to play the game. You know, if you want to actually have a retirement and have money, you still need to play the, the money game. And you need to not lose the game by winning as much as you can. And this is where, you know, good solid advice and being smart about it comes in. Um, also see my video about the, the sweet spot of investing. So in general, you know, I'd love, I'd love for this rule to say something like, you know, don't fall into the trap of not investing at all or being too safe with your investments. His next piece of advice is save 20% of your money. Easy enough, right? First of all, the math is good. If you save 20% of your money, you're going to crush it. You're going to have a fine retirement. Nothing wrong with that, right? But this really comes up with the greatest weakness of these Ten Commandments style rules, which is they completely ignore individual circumstances. And as a financial coach, I've seen a lot of different individual circumstances. And for a lot of people, if they're able to save 20% of their money, a lot of times they're able to save 25, 30, even more of their money. But there are people who can't even save 2% of their money, and that's actually their reality. Um, they literally are living hand to mouth. So the danger here is having these rules that like this, that are going to cause someone in that situation to pretty much throw up her hands and say, well, I can't do this. Uh, there's no way I can do this, right? And so I may as well just forget the whole thing, All right? That's the danger. And if you saw this rule and you're the kind of person who feels that this is the case, I'd like to challenge you a little bit. And instead of you know, reading this as a commandment to save 20% of your money. Ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, what can I do to put myself in the position to save 20% of my money? Notice how that completely changes the game here. It puts you in a position where you can do something about it. Now, what you do about it, that's another case. Do you need to quit your job and find another job? Do you need to have a side hustle, create more income? Do you need to change your living circumstances, change where you live, change how you live? But the point is now you're asking questions of what you can do to get to that point. His next rule of advice is pay your credit card balance in full every month, right? So the purpose of this rule is to just not pay the credit card companies any money. And I 100% agree with that. The credit card companies are a scourge on this nation. Now, that's great advice for someone who can have a credit card and can have a healthy relationship with that credit card. But if you're someone who is challenged by having a credit card, does not have a good relationship with debt, is in debt, get rid of the credit cards. You don't need them. It's like if you are on a diet and you just have a bunch of cookies and brownies in the house and you're just playing with fire having that credit card in your pocket. So get rid of it and you don't need it for emergencies. That's why you create an emergency fund. Credit cards aren't for emergencies. Emergency funds are for emergencies. If you're stuck in this, you're having a debt mindset, and that's what you need to get over first. So his, his next piece of advice is make financial advisors commit to a fiduciary standard. Now, what does this mean? So first of all, financial advisor is someone who invests your money for you. They're licensed to do that. Second, a fiduciary standard means that there's a standard that that financial advisor is going to act in your best interest, 
not in his or her best interest. In other words, she's there to make you rich, not herself rich, right? So really what this comes down to is being a good consumer of a service, right? So if you understand all of what we talked about before, understanding the fees you know, that you're paying for things like mutual funds, um, understanding you know, how that gets charged of the money that you have invested, if you've managed to do all of that, you probably don't even need a financial advisor in the first place. But if you decide that that's something that you want, then you're going to be in a good position to understand if that person is acting in your best interest or her own best interest. So you, you may want a financial advisor. Um, there can be some good reasons to have one. For example, if you are challenged by investing your own money because the swings just cause you too much angst, a financial advisor can be a good buffer there. If you value the advice that's specific to you and your situation, they can be valuable. Just understand what you're paying for, what you're getting, and how that serves you. His last piece of advice is promote social insurance programs to help people when things go wrong. Now what he means by this is to pay into Social Security and Medicare and programs like that. So if something goes wrong with you or anyone else really in the country, then they have that to fall back on. Now you already pay your taxes, right? So you're already paying into these programs. Um, whether you're employed by yourself or you have an employer. So I'm not really sure even why this is here, actually. But do recall that Dr. Pollock is a social scientist. So I believe he's actually making a political statement here. And the political statement is you should be in favor of paying into this uh, collective pool of money that anyone can draw upon in their time of need. Now. Again, I don't think this has anything to do with personal finance, and I'm not going to tell you how you should feel about paying your taxes or where those go. Um, but I will say, pay your taxes, <laughs> because the downside far outweighs um, any potential upside. And if you don't believe me, well, don't pay your taxes, right? <laughs> See what happens. So uh, thank you, and my next video, uh, part two, will have to do with my own version of an index card uh, for financial advice. Thanks.